go. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Simons Electron Microscopy Center's Winter EM course. We're honored today to have Joachim Frank kick off us uh, our single particle section. Joachim Frank probably needs no introduction, but he is a caddy member. 2017, he received not only the Wiley Prize, but the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. I think for this audience in particular, what's so notable is that his great strides and his foundational contributions to the field of Crow EM. Specifically, how do you deal with low dose images? How do you deal with statistical methods to analyze 2D projection images and make 3D reconstructions? As well as energy landscapes, and that also extends to understanding mechanisms of action more than just looking at a static reconstruction, but reaction pathways. And a lot of that is shown by his recent work with time resolve studies. He is also one of the early adopters of the maximum likelihood uh, methods. And um, especially when he was doing a lot of statistical methods back in the 80s, SPIDER was one of the programs that was really game changing. And that's what I actually learned how to do 3D reconstructions on. So without further ado, Joachim Frank. OK, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, happy to be here again. And uh, <coughs> what I normally, um, you know, I like to uh, talk <coughs> A bit about the groundwork, um, you know, um, sort of very, very basic concepts. Um, and over the years, um, my slide presentation has sort of grown, and as a consequence, I never get finished. Okay, <laughs> so still, I I always start at the beginning and not at the end. You know, uh, <clears throat> so. Um, uh, imaging, I, and I, I understand that you have already gotten uh, <coughs> introductions into all kinds of things, including electron microscopy and instrument and so forth. And so I, I couldn't coordinate this, I, so I'm going through th certain things that might overlap. Uh, imaging in the transmission electron microscope, there are different kinds of electron microscopes, uh, and we we are only dealing with transmission, which means that the electron goes all the way through. The specimen has to be thin enough for that to happen. Uh, and we're not uh, worried about backscattering electrons. We're not looking at surfaces. We're looking really at the material itself. <coughs> and uh, so the basic concept um, on how to get from a two dimension to three dimension is, uh, is uh, illustrated in this projection theorem. And that <coughs> tells you that, that if you have a three-dimensional object, you want to have, <coughs> you want to get information from it, uh, but the only thing that you can get is a two-dimensional projection. So what you do is you get two-dimensional projections in all different uh, orientations, and the projection theorem or projection slice theorem tells you that a projection in Fourier space is equivalent to a central section in, uh, <coughs> in the three-dimensional Fourier transform. So from that, uh, it, it's intuitive that what you need to do is, is you, you get, you collect as a, <coughs> a, a data uh, that are uh, sufficient to cover the, uh <coughs> the entire 3D uh, angular space. And then you do some kind of interpolation work uh, so that you fill out the entire three-dimensional uh, <coughs> Fourier transform. <coughs> and then there is a way back to, uh, to, to real space. And, and the people uh, who really deserve most of the credit Aaron Klug and David Dorsey. David Dorsey is, is actually the one who, who did all the work. Uh, and Aaron Klug uh, got the Nobel Prize. Uh, <coughs> and um, so, but it was the first ever 3D reconstruction, uh, not just in electron microscopy, but, but in all, any field uh, using, using computer uh, based on a theorem that was developed by Johannes Radon in 1917 at the time when there were no computers were available. So <coughs> what they did was uh, they had a, um, uh, they looked at a bacteriophage tail which had a highly uh, <coughs> helical symmetry. In any case like this, uh, you don't even need to have different 
or projection is a single projection is enough uh, because of the high symmetry. So you can essentially generate all the other views uh, from that one. And uh, so this is now an, is an example where three year reconstruction is done with a mathematical apparatus that is tailored to the geometry. Okay, so they developed this helical reconstruction, and it was it was good for nothing else but helical objects. And <coughs> the, the same thing happened later on with um, with Tony Crowther, who who <coughs> developed a, a way of reconstructing uh, spherical viruses with icosahedral symmetry. Uh, again, a mathematical apparatus that was tailored to the geometry. And so uh, <coughs> the assumption was always that there were uh, very, um, <coughs> very ordered arrangements. They were crystalline in, in, in some way. And, uh, and then you, you then create an, an, a computational procedure in order to deal with that particular geometry. And, and so, so this is essentially the, uh, the beginning into which I was thrown as a, as a graduate student. And, and so I had sort of desire to get beyond this and to say, why crystals at all? Why, why, you know, why can I not get a structure just from, <coughs> from single molecules? And, and just a sort of an, a, a broad overview, which you probably immediately recognize because of the introduction that you got, a uh, CAT scan, uh, a patient is stationary, uh, the X-ray source detector arrangement is, is going around in, in steps. Uh, but the important thing is that there is just one patient and not many patients that, that we sort of average in some way. Electron tomography is exactly the same principle except, except in this case the patient or the molecule is now uh, on, on a tilted uh, bed and uh, <coughs> the beam detector arrangement is stationary. Uh, so this is exactly equivalent mathematically. Uh, the only difference here is that uh, we cannot tilt all the way around because then you get obstructions uh, uh, to the beam. So there's always an electron tomography. There's always the problem of dealing with this kind of missing information. Uh, single pattern reconstruction, now the idea is uh, we don't have to tilt. The molecule already is doing is doing us the favor of tilting itself. Okay, so it exists in all different orientations, and um, so we get lots of information, all uh, with a single snapshot or with multiple snapshots, and all we have to do is then interpret the projections uh, in terms of a, a common coordinate system. <coughs> So a little bit uh, about uh, interaction of electrons bi with biological matter in this uh, interesting range from 100 to 300 kilovolt. Um, so we have we have here um, <coughs> uh, three different events. One is that the electrons uh, go simply in between the elect uh, between the atoms and and don't uh, don't they are they're not bothered by the matter at all. So they are unscattered. And then there are two different kinds of uh, scattering events. One is elastic, the other one inelastic. The elastic one, one is, is the important one because that gives us information, very specific information about the object. Uh, <coughs> there's no, electro uh, no, no energy uh, uh, dissipated, no energy being transferred. Uh, so the electron has exactly the same energy afterwards as before, but it carries an amount of information about the object that it has passed. Inelastic scattering is, is the opposite. <coughs> we have uh, energy is dissipated, uh, and it's it's being it's being used in order to kick an electron out of the uh, orbit. Um, ionization takes place. Uh, and the electron uh, is, is essentially completely out of phase. Uh, it's, it's sort of random, randomly associated with the phase of the uh, incoming. It doesn't give you, give you uh, information about the, about the object. 
And, and for biological matter, there's more inelastic than elastic scattering. So, uh, so the whole thing is, is, um, is, is just very, uh, it's very difficult to make use of the information. And the very important thing is that the, um, that the useful thickness is only in, in the range of something like two, uh, uh, 0.2 microns. Uh, beyond that, uh, you, could, you could consider the, uh, the object op opaque, essentially. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, <coughs> ionizing radiation, splitting bonds, and uh, this results in the creation of free radicals. Now, free radicals are, uh, are sort of an important concept here. Uh, they cause further damage as they migrate from the original side to another side of the molecule or to other molecules. And so, they, there is a whole cascade of, of events that produces further damage. So, in, it's intuitive that um, <clears throat> uh, one way of, of minimizing radiation damage is to keep the radicals from, uh, <clears throat> from migrating. And that is done by the low temperature, okay? So this is one of the useful uh, things about the low temperature. So cooling to liquid nitrogen traps the free radicals, reduce radiation damage. Then also intuitive is radiation damage affects small, high resolution features more strongly than features at low resolution. Okay, so you can really look at the at molecule and it, it disintegrates slowly and uh, at, at, at the very end, you still have some kind of a semblance of the molecule, but all the high resolution features are gone. <coughs> um, and. Uh, so there is, a, there is a concept of a critical uh, exposure, and, and here is, an, is a graph, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it comes from Grigoriev. Um, a critical exposure as a function of spatial frequency. Yeah, here is Grigoriev. Um, so you can essentially, there's a convenient lookup. Um, I don't know how general it is for, for molecules, but it's sort of some kind of a guideline. So you could say, um, well, I'm interested in, or I really need to get for angst, uh, for angstrom resolution. Uh, what, how much exposure uh, can I give you the molecule before it uh, disintegrates so that I don't see that f uh, anymore? So you can simply uh, use it as a lookup for angstrom in 0.25 uh, uh, angstrom to the minus one. To, it tells you this graph tells you. Uh, you cannot go beyond five electrons per angstrom square. Okay, so you can just look at uh, use this as a lookup table. <coughs> so, single means unattached. It doesn't mean one only. Okay, uh, like singles in a bar. That's that's the concept. Uh, free from contact contacts with other molecules. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, and and. And that affects really everything, the methodology of specimen preparation, electron microscopy, and image processing. So uh, all this is completely unique for, for single particles. While single particles, it's sort of obvious. No crystals are requ required. It gives you the native conformation, which is unaffected by crystal packing. Crystal packing sometimes, or very often, uh, just focuses, or, or fo focuses on one particular conformation, which minimizes uh, <coughs> the energy of the whole uh, formation of, of, of molecules, the, of the whole crystal. And that confirmation of the molecule uh, is not necessarily functionally relevant. So it gives you wonderful structure, high resolution structure, but, but the, this particular confirmation in which the molecule resides uh, might not have anything to do with the functional uh, structure. Uh, and an X-ray. Very often, people chop off certain things because they did, they hinder the uh, the crystallization. We we don't need to chop anything off. Multiple states can be visualized from the same sample, um, and it's ideal for looking at the dynamics of a molecular machine because here you can see all, all the different stages. Um, and up to 2012. 
Um, there were large computational challenges. Meanwhile, we have the <coughs> uh, GPUs, um, the very specialized computation, and uh, atomic <coughs> uh, atomic resolution was difficult to achieve for particle stacking symmetry. And this is all completely over now. We get we get too close to atomic resolution now. Okay, so. Uh, all particles in the, spe uh, in the specimen have approximately identical structure. All are linked by 3D rigid uh, body transformation, which means rota rigid rotations and ro translations. And the particle images are interpreted as a signal part, uh, which is the projection of the common structure, the, the structure common to all projections, plus noise. Uh, important requirement. Uh, is even angular coverage without major gaps. Okay. <coughs> Specimen preparation. Uh, so a, there used to be a time when we, we try to get the highest purity possible with the idea that uh, we want to have one single structure and, you know, free of, of any other uh, <coughs> kind of confirmations. Meanwhile, with the advent of classification techniques, we can really be very generous and say, let's look what, what there is, you know, we, because we'll, we'll find it. We'll find it out, and we can see how the structures are all related to one another. Um, so the sample is applied to the EM grid as a thin film, ideally a thousand angstroms, uh, and then the careful plotting, plotting is a critical step. Uh, the blotting force needs to be controlled in the blotting time, and now we have these uh, vitrification robots. Uh, <coughs> and the coverage with molecules determined by sample concentration, uh, geometry, makeup of metal, uh, metal grid. <coughs> now they are all kinds of different materials. Copper was the traditional one. Molybdenum was used for some time. The idea that it, it, has, uh, it has a very low uh, change um, with, the, uh, <coughs> with different temperatures. Uh, and gold has been added to this whole uh, <coughs> menu uh, recently uh, because of the, of the discovery of the uh, very, very strong uh, drum kind of movements. Uh, and here you uh, essentially well, I, I don't have to explain this, but this, the, this is interesting because the hand-built device uh, was not by Dubochet, it was, um, um, maybe it was the first one by Le Paul. Uh, so you can really hand-build this and it, and it uh, performs beautifully, but you don't have a control over the temperature, you don't have control over the uh, over blotting force, blotting time, so all this can be done in a uh, in a vitro bot, uh, specimen support. Uh, we now all have used the quantifoil or C flat, um, and uh, so this is of the geometry. Uh, here we, we have an example of a meniscus effect. Uh, here's the here's the edge of a hole, close to the edge of the hole. Uh, we very often have an accumulation uh, of molecules because we have a, a, a thick ice and a thin ice here. Uh, so this all can be can be controlled by you know all kinds of things that you probably already have heard about this. But here are the sort of the different layers. You you can have thin carbon, um, and uh, and here's the quantifold. <coughs> uh, and this here is comes comes out right here from Alex Noble's studies, uh, NYSBC. Uh, this was really an eye opener, and I'm very glad that we have these kinds of studies now. Now we know where the molecules are sitting, because previously there was simply the assumption they sit here beautifully all over the place, uh, and then it turned out, uh, well, for some they they, they are only on. on one layer, uh, if, if um, air water interface, or on both of them, and nothing in between. Um, and we have all kinds, of, we, we can have effects uh, where the molecules actually deteriorate 
And this is something that Bob Glaser has been studying and war warning about. So, um, so the lesson from this here is, is we, we cannot simply assume that we, we get the molecule just, just as, as, as they are in the, in the solution. There's something serious happening here in this process and uh, it's worth studying this some more and maybe there are some magic uh, discoveries that, um, that prevent this kind of deterioration on the air water interface. And gold grids, um, <clears throat> they were introduced in 2014 uh, by people at the MRC, and uh, they are now very often used. Uh, and here is the, this, this effect that I was t talking about, uh, <coughs> the vibration in Z direction, um, uh, which normal, normal grids uh, are doing. Here the gold grid is just a flat uh, line with minimal effects like this, and the other ones are sort of going all over the place. <coughs> uh, yeah, this, this was the one. Uh, important consideration is, is to what extent uh, do we have a, an, a, a global coverage um, of, the, of the angular uh, space uh, whenever, he, whenever he have, you have uh, a major gap then you get artifacts in, in the coverage of uh, Fourier space, and this produces artifacts in the reconstruction. Now, uh, this is, this is an, a coverage that is sort of passable because uh, it's, it's like single axis tilt. Uh, however, it produces a problem because we, we have reconstruction programs that really is assume this here, and uh, we don't want to we don't want to switch over to tomography light programs depending on the, the kind of coverage. Okay? So we want to, want to get as, as much as possible to something like this. Okay, um, <coughs> and I have this very nice illustration of a of sample uh, on a grid that was done by a graduate student of mine. So here's the copper grid that's covered with the uh, <coughs> Uh, with one of these hole foils um, in regular intervals, and here at the uh, here we see an, an individual hole. This it's now this is where the molecules are, and the molecules you have to imagine they're all moving. They're moving under the thermal environment, and so there there is normally not one conformation, but there's a variety of conformations, and so uh, somewhere along the line, there's all of a sudden this trapping, the deep freeze, there's one moment, and, and so each molecule you have to imagine is now trapped in exactly the state that it, that it was, wa wa was uh, at uh, immediately before. The salt and pepper, pepper <coughs> appearance, uh, which is simulated here, uh, occurs because of the sh uh, shot noise effect uh, because the, we, we need to go down with the, um, with the electron dose in order to avoid radiation damage. Okay. And implicit in this whole idea is, is that um, a single image of a single molecule uh, doesn't give you any information, very little information. It's, you, you need to average in order to bring out the signal uh, with the original strength. So averaging is always uh, part of uh, of the structure research. So then, uh, <coughs> the computer is trained to pick out particles, and then we get uh, we get a gallery. Uh, this is no longer simulated. This is an actual gallery, uh, and here this is an an actual micrograph, uh, eukaryotic ribosomes with the new cameras. And then what needs to happen is. Uh, we need to determine the orientations uh, of all these uh, projections and, uh, in, in, a, in a common coordinate system and put them into a 3D reconstruction. But as you see, uh, as you've seen, there are at least two different, uh, different uh, conformations. So what really needs to happen is that you have to sort them. You have to now sort them into those different 
her reconstruction, even though you don't even know uh, that um, you know where each of these come from. And this this amazing uh, achievement of getting of disentangling uh, the orientation and, and confirmations is is done by by the uh, by the software that that Ed mentioned before, uh, maximum likelihood uh, methods and. Uh, probably many people, or maybe everybody, is using uh, <coughs> one of the versions of Relyon, uh, which incorporates all these maximum likelihood ideas. Okay, so now I'm sort of jumping into a, a, a few theoretical things: uh, a signal on noise. Uh, the signal is is the the predictable part, deterministic. It's originating from the ob object that we're interesting in, uh, interested in. The, end, the noise is the stochastic part. It's unrelated to the signal. It's aperiodic. No two realizations are the same. V very often we talk about the signal to noise ratio. And what we mean to say is or, or we, we refer to the signal variance divided by the noise variance. Right? Whenever you see a quotation in cryo EM at least, or, and it says uh, signal to noise ratio of, of, uh, of two, it means the signal is twice as big as the noise. Well, two is, is, uh, is not very realistic. When you look, go to uh, raw micrographs, the signal to noise ra ratio is 0.1, which means is that the noise is 10, ten times bigger uh, than, than the signal. So in terms of, of signal recovery, these are the you know most most tough uh, <coughs> challenges uh, in the, in the field, uh, and and typically averaging over n noisy realization of a <coughs> signal increases the signal to noise ratio by a factor of n because we have the uh, variance ratios. And then and then uh, it's important to remember that. Um, what is signal, what is noise in a given experiment depends on the way the experiment is designed and depending on what you're interested in, okay? And uh, this is very clear from, well, it's very clear from this here because there's a concept of structural noise because the molecule might be sitting on, a, on a itself on a structure, but you're not interested in, on, in that structure uh, in, in that support structure. Uh, so from the point of view of what you want to learn, uh, the support structure is noise. But from the point of view of the, mic uh, of the microscope, this, this is just structure, okay? So, uh, so the whole, so depending on that concept, uh, you, get, you really get different measurements for to noise ratio. <coughs> so here, here was just an uh, an, another example for simulate images of, ribos of the ribosome at uh, 0.1 signal to noise ratio. So that's sort of the, uh, you know, the rough uh, appearance of these. Uh, Fourier transforms. You you already had explanation of Fourier transforms, so I have kind of can go through this uh, very very quickly. You can think of the of, of the Fourier transform as a composite decomposition into sine waves where each wave has a different uh, a, um, wavelength and, and direction of wave and, and a different uh, phase and a different amplitude. So we mix all these different waves and all possible combination of waves in order to recreate uh, an image, any given image. <coughs> and this is the uh, the definition of the discrete Fourier transform. Um, and then you, you, have to, you have to realize that a, a discrete Fourier representation, the one that I had before here, and the one that we're working with all the time, this is really not, it's not a representation of an image, but rather it's, an, it's a representation of an infinite lattice of images, okay? So this is important because uh, because of the uh, overlap effect. Uh, and I 
you know, so this is my, my notation is there's a Fourier operator or and I always denote the <coughs> a Fourier transform with the with a large um, <coughs> with a capital letter uh, of the associated function. Okay, uh, so we have Fourier transform inverse Fourier transform as an operator. The special frequency is always k. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, one one of the things it, it, I I always like to point out is possible theorem. It's it's a it's a uh, it's a theorem uh, of conservation of energy, uh, and uh, the energy is really this the power spectrum the f of k. Uh, if you integrate over the power spectrum, then this is an uh, a measure of the energy. It's like the information uh, uh, measure of the information contents of the image. <coughs> And the total power is the same in real and Fourier space. And so the Fourier transformation uh, conserves uh, the power, or conserves the energy. Uh, so you can you can either <coughs> integrate you can either integrate over uh, the image and and subtract the average and square and integrate over everything. Uh, uh, so this is. Uh, the uh, variance, and you integrate over it, uh, over the entire image field. And this is the same as, as if you integrate over the power spectrum and leave out, leave out the, the zero term. Now, leaving out the zero term is equivalent to taking the average away here. Okay? So this is always the same. This is the possible theorem. So, points red function and contrast transfer function. Uh, <coughs> so, in an optical instrument, the aperture limit, uh, the aberration of the lens, and other imperfections have the effect that a single point in the object is imaged as an extended two dimensional function and not as a delta function. But an ideal instrument would make a point out of a point. So, it would be a delta function in, in, in two dimension. And instead of the point, you get the point spread function. This is literally, uh, it tells you how much a point spreads into the image. And the Fourier transform of the point spread function in, in a bright field case, a weak phase object, is a contrast transfer function. So these are Fourier pairs. You can take a point spread function, go into Fourier space, it becomes the contrast transfer function. You can go from tra contrast transfer function, make an inverse Fourier transform, you get the point spread function. Okay? And the contrast transfer function, and you will have seen this expression already, or this is an, <coughs> it, it tells you, um, <coughs> It has the contrast transfer function is the sinus of the wave aberration function. This is the wave aberration. This is uh, this tells you how much the wave uh, differs from from a from a spherical wave. And there is a spherical aberration, or uh, which is inbuilt into the lens or inbuilt into the microscope. You can't do anything about it. And then. You have another term which you can control, which is the defocus term. Now, the interesting thing is that they are not matched in the power of spatial frequency. <coughs> one goes by by the fourth power, the other one by the second uh, by the second power. What it means is is you cannot you cannot compensate uh, for the wave aberration by making an adjustment here in the defocusing. Uh, it only works for a certain area, and then it falls down because of the different powers of these different terms. Okay. 
But the other interesting thing is that this starts with zero. Uh, <coughs> this goes down to zero. This whole thing starts with zero. So um, at, the, at the very origin, and for the small scattering angles, um, you don't you don't have any wave wave aberration. <coughs> Okay, here are the different times. Um, and uh, spheric operation really means that, that um, <coughs> when you go out uh, <coughs> uh, uh, yeah, at, at um, far parts of the lens, uh, the, the rays are more bent than uh, for the ones that are uh, yeah, close to the optical axis, which means that um, we can now go along here and, and look uh, where where do I where do I get the the smallest um, <coughs> uh, sort of disk of confusion? And there is a, there is a particular one in which uh, you have uh, the smallest diameter, but it's 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 much bigger. Uh, obviously, than than uh, than a point. So here is an example for a point spread function. This is really computed for a particular contrast transfer function. <coughs> you can see that it that it's uh, you know very very nice uh, peak, um, which is exactly centered or uh, where it should be, and then there is this side waves, <coughs> depending on uh, the defocusing, um, you can have a very, very strong kind of um, uh, <coughs> uh, feet. They're called feet because apodization means take, taking the feet away. Apodization is in light optics means uh, making the lens in such a way that the feet are, are, are gone, okay. Uh, so apodization, so, so these are sort of feet here. And uh, so depending on the, on the defocusing, uh, these feet can be very strong, which means that you, you will have effects uh, that are very far away from, uh, from the point that is being imaged. So now, just just think about the concept of, of point spread function. What does it mean? Well, the, the meaning can be very clearly ex expressed even if you take an object that consists only of discrete points. Okay, then, then it makes immediate sense. Here, the, here's an object that consists of four points. One, two, three, four. They're completely separate from each other. Uh, <coughs> and now you pass this through an electron microscope. Uh, what does it mean? It means that, that essentially wherever the point is, you have to think about centering the point spread function. And the operation of centering something on each point is called convolution. You convolve the image with a point spread function and that results in, in the point spread functions uh, planting itself right onto each point. Okay? So that's convolution. That's what it means. And here, so here, convolution is a very simple concept. It only becomes difficult to imagine now when these points are very close together. Then, then all these point spread functions overlap here in the image, and then you have to integrate over all of them, okay? So a real object is not, is not just, unless you go down to the other atoms, but a real object is not just <coughs> discrete, it is continuous. So you have to make a continuous operation of putting the point spread function on, on, on each of these individual parts, and then uh, integrate over all of these. <coughs> uh, 
Now the contrast transfer function. Um, <coughs> where does the contrast transfer function come from? Um, <coughs> I, I mentioned before that um, for uh, close to the optical axis, we don't have any wave aberrations. <coughs> what does it mean? We have no wave aberration. Elastic scattering implies that um, we have a 90 degree phase, phase shift. So the, the, the beam is shifted by 90 degrees. Now we don't have any wave aberrations, which means that this 90 degree, degree shifted scattered wave interferes with the primary ba wave uh, that has not done any phase shift. When they interfere, they don't do anything to each other. They don't interfere. You know, they're sort of orthogonal to each other. There's nothing. An ideal instrument, an ideal electron microscope shows you nothing, okay? That's the paradox. <coughs> uh, we need wave aberrations in order to get contrast. So the instrument needs to be non-ideal in order for us to see anything. Where do, where, where do the effects come from? They come from the wave operation. So the wave operation now start at a certain time <coughs> at, at, at zero, so there's nothing. Now, now it go, goes and, and, and <coughs> gets, to, um, gets to 90 degrees. That's perfect, and we have 180 degree shift against the primary wave, and we get maximum contrast. And then you go further, further over, uh, and go to <coughs> um, 270 and so, and so forth. So you get alternate regions of high, uh, of positive contrast and negative contrast, and in between you have zero contrast. That's how the uh, that's where the contrast transfer function comes uh, comes from. Okay, so here we we already have the effect, the effect of of the. Uh, <coughs> constructive and destructive interference between primary wave and, and a wave that had initially 90 degrees, and now it has added on the wave aberrations of the, of the microscope, which gets bigger and bigger as we go out in spatial frequencies. Okay, so now we, have the, we see the effect of this. <coughs> uh, here we have a region where we start with zero contrast, we go to negative phase contrast, and we have a region here uh, <coughs> where we we use negative defocus term uh, in in order to com combat the positive spherical aberration term, or, or the other way around. Uh, at any rate, here is a is a region where the two terms compensate for a while, you know, but one of them goes by the fourth power, the other one for the second power, so one of them sort of all of a sudden takes off and, and forgets forgets about this beautiful situation here. Uh, so here we have an <coughs> we have an, a defocus setting that produces a very large contrast interval. Other defocus settings would not do this, they would go like this. Now <coughs> this here potentially goes on forever gets more and more, like it gets into more and more oscillation. Uh, this effect here is effect, uh, uh, an effect of partial coherence. <coughs> it means that the, uh, <coughs> that the illumination has a, has a divergence, and because of the divergence, uh, we, get, we get different contrast transfer functions for different incident, uh, uh, incidents. Okay, and that's how uh, all this here is is um, <coughs> is going going down. This is a so-called envelope function, which describes uh, how much this goes down. Now, uh, the <coughs> uh, partial coherence is not a big deal anymore because the uh, the new instruments have, have very high uh, very high coherence. The whole point of introducing the field emission gun is to get the very high coherence, uh, <coughs> and uh, so normally you don't you don't get this effect until much 
much later on. And um, so there is another uh, envelope function which is due to energy spread uh, or the focus spread. <coughs> And so, um, since um, since you can have different defocuses for dif for different positions of the particle, uh, for instance, they could be lying on one side or the other side, uh, and these uh, <coughs> boundaries could could be as much as um, you know fifteen hundred angstroms away from each other. Uh, this means that you have essentially two different defocuses or you have an entire defocus range. If you integrate over this defocus range, you will see that you get another envelope function on top of this. So you get a resolution limiting effect. If you don't take, uh, if you don't care, take care of it, and uh, for instance, by measuring the defocusing for each individual uh, particle, or measuring the CTF for each individual one. <coughs> so here are examples for contrast transfer functions. In the contrast transfer functions, of course, they leave a signature uh, in, the, in the Fourier spectrum, and that's called the tone rings. Tone uh, discovered this in, or described this in something like 1965 or 1964 for the first time. Uh, so <coughs> what you see, what you see here is, um, <coughs> you see white, black, white, black. This corresponds to negative contrast, no contrast, positive contrast, no contrast, negative. Okay, so you have to, you have to count. And if the setting is on the negative side of the, of the defocus, then, then this is always the negative contrast positive contrast, negative contrast, and so forth. You can count. So what do they show? They show how far the information goes in Fourier space. That's very convenient. Um, it also shows whether you have any other effects, such as astig astigmatism. Normally in, in microscopes that are professionally operated as they are here, then you don't have any uh, residual astigmatism. So you don't have to worry about it. You have to appreciate it more, what these guys are doing, because this is always uh, you know, in the wings. <coughs> um, so uh, <coughs> two-dimensional processing means to average, uh, to average like images to eliminate noise. And like is, is, is important. Uh, they need to be very similar to each other. Otherwise, averaging doesn't make any sense. And what does it mean? Uh, within the image, the molecule lies in arbitrary directions. Alignment means we have to turn the images, and position them in such a way that the molecules are in superposition. So it's the contents of the images that needs to be in superposition. <coughs> so this is um, a successful application of, of ideas uh, on, on two-dimensional averaging by alignment. And uh, we published this in 1981. This is the, one of the first demonstrations that the whole thing works. Uh, <coughs> so. Uh, the alignment is done by cross-correlation, or this is the translational cross-correlation function. You can imagine that you have two images, you put them on top of each other on a light table, and they, <coughs> if they contain the same molecule in, in the same orientation, uh, and now you shift them against each other, and you just, on a light table, you see, you, you look only how much light goes through all in all, you know? What's the integrated uh, light transmission in any position? And then you will find out that this is maximized when 
when the the images are in in exact the super uh, superimposition. Or and you can say the other way around. You can say, oh, I can do this completely blindly, and all I have is, is a detector here which tells me when do I get the maximum of light flux through. And you shift randomly in all different position, and then you find the maximum, and then at that maximum, this is exactly where the alignment happened. Well, this is really done, or uh, this kind of computation is done by the cross-correlation function, because it's the, it's the integral of the cross product in all different x, y positions. Okay? So <coughs> technically, what you would do if you did it by hand, um, you would shift it in all kinds of different positions. And in each position, uh, you, could, you would plot the result of this product onto this point, uh, on the point of RPQ. Okay? Here's an RPQ, it is the shift vector. And for this particular integral or sum, you get a value, you plot it here. So now you do this for all possible RPQs that make sense, and so you get an entire table here that tells you in each point how much you get. And then if you then stand back and look at the whole thing, you will see that it becomes maximum somewhere. It has a peak. That peak uh, tells you, aha, this is the RPQ that I need to know, that, that I need to use in order to shift the the images into exact superposition. <coughs> so now they are uh, they are very convenient theorems. Uh, one of them is 2D convolution. The other one is 2D cross correlation. Um, so here I have them as integral e expression, but you can also write them down as as discrete uh, sums. Um, so here is a convolution integral. Uh, it's a signal <coughs> convoluted with a point spread function. Uh, so it's <coughs> you get the signal by integrating, by, by convoluting the object with a point spread function. This is the operation that I told you before, this individual or superposition. The short notation uh, which I like to use is S of R equal to O of R convoluted with point spread function. Now, if you go into Fourier space, there's this important theorem that tells you that the Fourier transform of the signal is simply the scalar product between the Fourier transform of the object and the Fourier transform of the point spread function, which in electron microscopy is the CDF. Okay? It's a simple scalar product. Instead of this very cumbersome convolution integral, we now have a have a <coughs> uh, have such a plain uh, product, uh, which tells you it is very convenient to use this here instead of that in order to get or to compute uh, a, a convolution uh, or or to describe the effects uh, that an instrument has on an object, okay? So it's image formation with a particular point spread function. You, you, you can immediately express it in this way and then go back into real space. There's, an <coughs> there's a similar theorem for 2D cross correlation that looks just a little, little, uh, little different. Uh, the cross correlation function is defined in this way. It's a well, in fact, here, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there should be an S1 and S2 because two different signals are being cross-correlated. Okay, cross-correlation of one against the other, uh, <coughs> this gives you a result for each different uh, <coughs> uh, shift vector. Um, so here, different shift vector are, are prime. <coughs> Uh, no different shift vectors are our prime is the, is the one we integrate over. Um, okay, so this, these are the two images that 
uh, shift it against each other, and then we, we get the better result. Uh, short notation, cross correlation is S1, and then I have this special s uh, symbol uh, <coughs> cross correlated with with the, with the S2. Now the uh, the simple theorem is it's again a scalar product, but this time with a conjugate uh, <coughs> with a conjugate of the conjugate complex uh, of, of the other term. Right? So convolution theorem, cross correlation theorem look very similar. I, in one case, there's the there's this extra star. <coughs> and that, of course, tells you that it's very, very fast to, uh, to perform cross-correlation, because you then can do it as a Fourier operation like this. That's what's doing, what's, what's going on in these boxes that you use all the time. <coughs> so, uh, image is identical, then the CTA, uh, is <coughs> then the cross-correlation peak is very sharp, well-defined. Uh, it's ideally, it's even a, a delta function. Uh, here we have another one. The images are dissimilar, but the phase is still at the same place, okay? Uh, it means that we still get a peak, but the, pe the peak is at the same position because the phase is in the same position. But, but we have only a very, uh, <coughs> very low similarity which means that the, uh, uh, <coughs> which means that we, we get a very blurred peak. It, it means that the uh, we don't have a, at the same uh, precision of alignment. The alignment is not as well defined. <coughs> um, here's here's an, an example how one can very fast solve uh, these kinds of problems. Uh, <coughs> The, the autocorrelation of an image uh, is <coughs> in Fourier space is, um, <coughs> oh, I should, I should have done O here. Okay, it's an OH times OH. Okay, uh, anyway, here I renamed it signal. Um, so here's the, here's the signal unaffected by, by, the <coughs> uh, by the CTF. And here's a CDF, okay? So signal times CDF times signal times C CDF. Um, conjugate, autocorrelation means correlation against itself. It's a cross-correlation of an image against itself, okay? Uh, so SH times SH conjugate, and you can rearrange them because this is all multiplication, is <coughs> S or times S conjugate times H times H conjugate, which means that this autocorrelation function of S convoluted with the autocorrelation of the points wave function in real space, okay? Here's another example how this can be very quickly solved by using a uh, convolutional correlation theorem. <coughs> cross-correlation of two images of the same signal with different CDFs would be S1 uh, times H1 times S1, it's the same signal, times H2, different CDF, conjugate. Now you rearrange, then you have S1, S1, uh, conjugate, times H1, H2, conjugate. It means in real space, it's the autocorrelation uh, of the of the signal convoluted with the cross correlation of the point spread functions. Okay, so these, if if you if you're conversant in these theorems, you can solve these things immediately. You don't have to go through these integrals. <coughs> and um, <coughs> so what it what it means, um, incidentally. If you go back here, um, <coughs> because of the uh, cross-correlation of the different point spread functions, uh, <coughs> depending on uh, how different the point spread functions are and how different the, the focuses are, we can have a situation in which the 
cross correlation peak actually gets negative, okay, depending on the, the difference in, in defocus. So it, it, you know, the cross correlation is not necessarily positive uh, because you get these contrast inversions depending on the defocus. <coughs> And, and this is just a reminder that uh, when, when, you, when you use Fourier methods, uh, you have to be uh, worried about the fact that uh, an image is not an image. It is an infinite series of images. And so you have to make space around it. You have to, you have to make some kind of padding uh, because when you do cross-correlation, it implies that you have shifts, or, and you would run into a neighbor image when you don't uh, <coughs> uh, uh, provide uh, this kind of padding space. Okay, so instead of an uh, so this padded image, you have to think of as as such a series, and so any shifts of two of these entities against each other will not uh, lead to an overlap of the signal. Here's a practical example. Uh, there are two padded images like, like this kind. And, uh, the <coughs> and this would be the cross-correlation function. And if, if, if I draw an, an xy axis, then you can see that the peak is shifted by a certain amount. And that shift tells you exactly by how much you have to shift one image in order to get into the superposition with the other one. <coughs> OK, here's an, here's an example of the cross-correlation function of micrographs of the same specimen as a function of the difference in defocus. You can see that for some of them, all of a sudden, the contrast inverts. So you have negative peak uh, surrounded by, by some of the rings. Um, so now this is, this is sort of, um, this goes right back uh, when I started um, with this whole single particle alignment stuff. Uh, <coughs> it's a criterion for detection of the cross-correlation peak, uh, which tells me uh, when is alignment feasible and it turns out, so, so what we have to worry about is low dose, OK? And, uh, and the critical dose, uh, we have to go down to uh, at least to the critical dose. And we want, want, want to find out how big does the particle has to be uh, in order to get uh, accuracy of alignment sufficient to get to a certain resolution. And that's essentially what, what I looked at together with Owen Sexton. And this formula told, told us at, the, at that time that in, indeed, for uh, even for ice, which we didn't have at the time, e but even if we had such a thing as ice embedding, we would still have enough contrast um, for sufficiently large molecule in order to get to a uh, three angstrom resolution. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, I told you about the two-dimensional cross-correlation. The question is, what do we do if we have arbitrary positions of the, of the images? So they don't start out in the same orientation. Uh, we can combine translation and rotational alignment by using invariants. <coughs> uh, in order to understand this, we, we look at the properties of the autocorrelation function. Uh, <coughs> uh, the autocorrelation function, if we have an image, for instance, here, it has these three strong features. and, and <coughs> You can see that they are uh, in these directions. We we would get the overlap. Okay, we shift the image on the on onto itself along here. Then we get an overlap of this features with that one. We shift it in this direction. We get this kind of overlap, and so forth. So there, the different kinds of overlap. The 
to plot it out, you get the co uh, autocorrelation function, which is really, it, it shows it shows this, it shows this vector, that vector, and uh, the same happens if we if we shift it the other way around. So the autocorrelation is is uh, centrosymmetric, okay. Um, so, yeah, but the most important thing is that it, it preserves directional features of the image, preserves it. So we can use this. Uh, <coughs> uh, we can use this property in order to uh, align images rotationally. So we would first um, uh, get them well. Yeah, we don't. We don't need to get them into the proper uh, shifts. Uh, the whole idea is the autocorrelation function is centrosymmetric and and it it it's on the origin, no matter where the where the, where the particle is. Okay. So here are uh, here are examples of particles. They are in arbitrary positions, in arbitrary rotations. <coughs> this is the gallery of autocorrelation functions. <coughs> It always is uh, uh, right in the center. Okay, autocorrelation function is always around the origin. It's never shifted, and it preserves these kinds of in internal distance features. So now we can take uh, for a gallery of images, we can take a gallery of autocorrelation functions, and. Um, <coughs> Rotate them uh, and, and find find the orientation. So you can find the orientation of the images by finding the orientations of the autocorrelation functions. Once we have found them, we rotate the images in the correct uh, location, and then we can use the translation as a next step. And this entire scheme is right here, uh, where this is implemented. So this is an example of where we can um, do translational rotational alignment uh, uh, in, in, in one swoop. Um, then it, I just want to want to um, indicate that uh, we we get as a byproduct uh, of averaging we always get a, a variance map, and and here is an is an example of variance map in this paper that I told you about. <coughs> so it's very instructive. This is an <coughs> a small subunit of the of the HeLa ribosome in a particular preferred orientation. It's brought into this orientation by the negative stain because it loves to, to lie on this side or the other side. So this is just a left facing uh, view. <coughs> now what happens is that um, this, this is prepared by negative staining. The negative staining results in in a meniscus <coughs> of stain that sort of partially covers the sides of the of the particle, but it covers it in different at different depths. There's a depth variation. Now that depth variation is picked up by the variance map. Okay, the the region of highest variance. Uh, are the regions exactly around the boundary here, where, the, where the, there is an <coughs> a variation in the amount of, of staining. Okay, so the staining sort of laps up and down right here. So, um, lesson from this is uh, look at your variance map. If something is not kosher, look at the variance map. It might tell you uh, an amazing amount of information. It, it might tell you that there's, there is something, uh, there's something not, not enough classified. You know, you you might have a, a local, um, <coughs> a local variability that indicates that you re may may have to go further in in the classification. Um, and so, you know, alignment of frames is, is of course done all the time now 
in the movie mode of the direct electron detection uh, cameras. Uh, and uh, this makes it possible to correct drift. Um, and it also makes it possible to, uh, <coughs> to weight the frames according to uh, how much damage uh, might, might, have, might have happened before. Uh, and, and these are uh, from uh, Shaw's shares. Uh, they are examples for the amount of shifts of individual molecules. The, these are not the actual shifts, but, but they are magnified uh, by a factor of 5 or 10. <coughs> Resolution criterion. Uh, <coughs> The Rayleigh criterion uh, operates with the idea that you you are able to put, you know, two points on a light microscope and then look what happens as a result of uh, putting them in two different positions. We don't have that luxury in electron microscopes. We cannot put atoms or anything at distance between each, uh, each other. So we have we have this completely different. Uh, definition uh, <coughs> we have a, a resolution as a reciprocal quantity and it's measured in Fourier space and it is defined as the spatial frequency up to which the information is reproducible by some measure of reproducibility so we decompose the information uh, into rings or in three dimensional into shells and then uh, we look uh, <coughs> at uh, the total <coughs> we essentially form a, form a sum uh, a cross sum over all uh <coughs> individual terms or along this entire ring and, and that cross sum uh, tells us uh, to what extent these rings are in agreement and typically you have very good agreement in the middle and then you get more and more and less agreement toward the, toward the end. And this is the so-called Fourier ring correlation or Fourier shell correlation. <coughs> okay, so you probably have seen the, this definition before. And then, you know, you're probably familiar with um, what, what's pretty much uh, a standard now, one ensures that the two uh, data sets that we compare with each other are independent, which means that they have not seen, they have not undergone the same procedure, image processing pr procedure. Ideally, they're, they're even taken from completely independent experiments. And then we make this comparison. If we have this kind of independence ensured, then, uh, according to uh, what Richard Henderson figured out, uh, we can use a, uh, <coughs> a figure of merit criterion that is known from X-ray crystallography uh, and look um, and essentially declare, declare that the resolution is uh, where the Fourier ring or shell correlation falls to 0 0.143. Uh, this here was an earlier cutoff. It was a very conservative cutoff before this whole formulation was was um, was put put together. So you you see in the earlier literature you see a lot of uh, uh, quotation where a 0.5 was used. Um, and then there's the curious thing of three sigma, which was propagated by some people, and it, it didn't make any sense. Um, okay, so uh, just go by this, but make sure that the data sets that you compare are are independent. <coughs> um, all right, so I'm already already know that I'm running out of time. Um, so I just wanted to tell you about multivariate data analysis, classification. Um, 
heterogeneity. Obviously, we have different viewing angles, different conformation of the molecules. <coughs> and we want to have a way of sorting them that is, that is independent of, of uh, any subjectivity. Um, okay, so in two dimensions, we want to have an inventory of, of existing views. Uh, this very, uh, you have programs that you can use and it's very convenient uh, before you go to, a, uh, to an extensive study, you want to know whether uh, you get anywhere close to a, to a good three-dimensional coverage of the molecule. You immediately spot if, if, if there's only one particular view represented. So in this particular case, it looks like it looks pretty much like there are two views, and that's that's pretty much it. There's sort of variations of two views, uh, some kind of side views, and the other way. <coughs> um, so in order to explain classification, uh, I just I just wanted to um, you know invoke this <coughs> representation. Um, of an image in a high-dimensional Euclidean space. <coughs> so it can be best understood by thinking of aligned images as vectors in a high-dimensional space. The 64 by 64 pixel uh, image is a vector in a 4096-dimensional space. <coughs> so what what is this notation good for? Well, um, if if two images are similar to each other, it really means that that um, the the vectors that uh, represent these images are very close by in in this high dimensional space. So if you have a whole set of, of images that are all similar to each other, they cluster, they form a cluster in this high dimensional space. And we can, I'm gonna cut you off in five minutes so we have room for questions. Good, sure, all okay. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I make the entire PowerPoint available, which right. goes into the, the three dimensional reconstruction ideas and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but I feel um, um, you know, cutting these things short, it doesn't, doesn't do, anybody any good right. Right. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so cut me off right now <laughs> five <laughs> minutes yeah. five minutes so you can uh, wrap up this up okay uh, um, so so now it's important um, to show the concept and uh, show the concept of, of multivariate statistical analysis um, I'm I'm using an image con containing only two pixels Okay, that's a very poor idea of a pixel, uh, of, uh, of an image. Uh, okay, so the <coughs> these, these images are distinguished by uh, the gray values. So the gray value goes all the way from zero to one, from zero to one, okay? And here are the extreme images, right? So, so this entire, uh, you know, the entire range of images, all, the, all two pixel images here. And now, now think about um, clusters formed by images uh, of this kind. Um, and I'm plotted, plot them here. So they are particular combination of gray values here, okay? We immediately see that from, from there that these are two clusters. Uh, but the computer doesn't see that. Uh, if, <coughs> if, we, if, we look, if we look here, from here, they're pretty much, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, form, form one continuum. Here they form a continuum. Um, <coughs> well, actually, this is a fortuitous case in which the, uh, projection out to axis one give, gives us a clustering. Uh, but that doesn't happen very often. And uh, 
So I, I just turned this whole distribution around in order to uh, show the difficulty. Uh, now you can see projection in this direction or doesn't show you any clustering. Projection in this direction doesn't show you any clustering. So, so then uh, essentially a clever person would say, well, you, you, know, you do it all wrong. You, 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 you go with the initial axis, throw these axes away, create new axes, create an axis that gives you the best separation. Okay? So that's multivariate statistical analysis. It, it introduces a new coordinate system in such a way that you get maximum separation. And the, the first axis would be, would go this way, right? So multivariate statistical analysis, uh, the whole <coughs> uh, <coughs> approach uh, finds this first axis uh, of best separation. And then it finds the next axis that gives separation in the other direction and so forth, okay? <coughs> So this is the one. This is the axis that we require that immediately solves the problem. Okay? So we need to find that axis. And, and we, we throw the initial coordinate system away. The initial coordinate system is really the one that is defined by the, by the <coughs> Cartesian coordinates of the image. <coughs> Okay, so, all right, I already told you that. And, and so, so this is the thing that I, I just want to wanna get across, okay? And then you can rudely interrupt me. So, what would we do? This is the unknown axis that we want to find, okay? So, we say, given that unknown axis. What kind of property should that have? Well, the property that it should have is, is that the projections onto that axis from each point should, should be maximum, okay? So we take all the points that we had in this cluster and perform a projection onto the, this new postulated axis. So it gives you, it gives us a maximization, an optimization problem. Uh, we we want to maximize uh, the the projections of of these individual contributions from the different vectors onto this axis to be determined. And this is the max uh, mathematical expression uh, that follows from there. And so it becomes immediately an eigenvector problem, an eigenvector eigenvalue problem. Okay? So the, the answer to this problem is uh, <coughs> uh, that we need to solve this eigenvalue problem uh, with these particular matrices. OK, so. So then I'll address the question. So, um, I think from Alex Noble's work, we have a clear idea that we don't have a very good handle on our samples. I wasn't at that GRC, but I've heard at one period of time that Richard Henderson of the TRC is saying, what's a future microscope? And they said, oh yes, it's in 10 years, there'll be a microscope that's gonna be 300 kV with an energy filter and a CS corrector, and it's gonna cost $10 million. And then now that's reality. That's uh, what he said. That's what he said. And then uh, I think he's also been on record saying, what is needed in the future right now would be maybe a 100 kV big microscope with a direct detector. Um, so in terms of, so that's, so we have some idea about samples, freezing methods, some idea of what an ideal microscope might be. But what's missing is software and algorithms. What developments do you think will be on the horizon that we really need to work on in terms of that space? I don't, I don't know. Um, <coughs> Hard questions for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think there's, um, I think there's not enough done uh, to deal to deal with the with these large ensembles 
that we have. Uh, we, uh, I think from the point of view of, of the amount of data that we have, um, we have a very myopic way of, of, um, uh, of processing them and, and approaching the entire problem. And it, it is CryoSpark uh, showed us that there's an immense progress that can be done if, if we all of a sudden take a bird, bird's eyes view and, and look at the whole thing and, you know, wait a moment, what, what are we doing here? And, you know, it's crazy what we're doing, you know, because of all these different um, searches that were absolutely unnecessary. And, and so, so these kinds of things, similar kinds of things, to look at the entire ensemble at the same time uh, is, is, is are necessary, and I don't know. I don't know, you know, what what direction uh, this this would take. Um, and and uh, as you know, I've been I've been working on on one kind of ensemble ap approach, uh, which is this uh, manifold embedding, in which really uh, the entirety of the data uh, are uh, are looked at. Uh, under under sort of one uh, one view, uh, but but that's um, I mean this is sort of on the, in the whole picture that that might not be the limit. Yeah, I, I can imagine further developments, and we have all these fantastic techniques. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, time resolved. Uh, experiments now. If you if you think about time resolved and put all these data together, then you have some kind of a time axis in there, and uh, so so you you can you can think of, of a data analysis that that probes the depth uh, of that additional dimension and goes crosswise somewhere, you know, under under any diagonal direction. Well, in terms of, there's been always, well, you know, my, I might uh, avoid resolution as in terms of SFC, but in terms of when you look at a map and you're trying to look at details that are meaningful coming from a structural biologist, what is your criteria that there's been a reasonable map? Because resolution is not the only criteria. Um, well, you know, we, we don't do anything different from, from other people. Uh, there are certain criteria on, on what you should see at a particular resolution, uh, in terms of secondary structure and and uh, uh, features of, of side chains and so forth, and, uh, um, uh, you know, to some extent, these are, these are all very qualitative, and you know, we still don't don't we don't still have, don't have a very very good grips on on uh, what the true resolution is, and maybe there is nothing nothing like this. It, it, it's sort of <clears throat> like a single party cry um, is interesting in 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 that uh, we have a continuum of resolutions uh, across across the molecule and uh, and that um, now this is one of the software developments which is really uh, very important uh, which is to have a, uh, a create a, a modeling environment which uh, which follows this changes in resolution in, in, in a uh, <clears throat> you know without without any uh, you know jumps but but rather in a continuous way so you you get from a from a, a, a core very often where you get resolutions where you can uh, do the modeling um, Without knowing any sequence information, and then you get to places where you absolutely need this, this sequence information, and then the definition of rotamers and so forth gets more and more uh, difficult. So, <clears throat> so what we need is a, is a is a modeling environment for this. We also need some kind of a way of expressing what what we find. Yeah. 
and and what what does it mean in terms of modeling and structure? Probably the last question on this. Other people, I'm looking around this room. I see three quarters of the people here are early career, or if they're not technicians, postdocs, or grad students. So I guess Bill and myself are uh, exempted on that because we already know what our career is. But you you are an active academic. You, you're running research labs. What piece of advice? Where do you think people should have more foundational knowledge? Uh, because as as we are running facilities here, I'm no longer training my prospects, and that might be a good thing because the field has moved on, that they don't have to go through 10 years of toil to know how to fix stigmation. Yeah. Um, and there probably are other techniques and other fields that modern scientists should know more about. Math, I, I guess, should always be on that list, but what else? Yeah. What else? Well, from my point of view, um, we, we, we got into a very dangerous uh, situation now because people don't don't really know the background of, of the stuff. They, they don't know what Reliant is doing. Uh, and and not, not just the maximum likelihood part, but, but everything else that it's doing. They, they don't know that. And <clears throat> uh, during the time when, when Spider was, was, was used, even in my lab, I, nobody uses Spider anymore. That's the problem. So, <clears throat> so but but with Spider, you had a workbench. You could actually, you could, you could teach image processing by saying, you know, do do these and these operations in this and this order, or solve this and this problem, and given these and these commands, and and then people could do this, uh, and they would learn in the process. Right now, uh, we we have nothing of that sort anymore. And so we need we need to uh, reintroduce this kind of workbench, uh, so that so that people have a have a very solid conceptual knowledge. Right now, I I see it, it it's out of the window. Well, cross park is the black box for me too when I run it. Like, yeah. don't know half of what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. Black boxes are dangerous. Knowledge is power. Yeah. But as we go towards deep learning, there are literal black boxes. So. The black boxes create <laughs> another black box. Yeah, right. It's a Maybe even smarter than any one of us. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. I, I, it must be interesting because this room is actually more, it's like double the people than normal in the class. <laughs> Don't encourage the students to ask questions. I'm encouraging the students, even if you think they're true. Right. Yeah, we are, we are the students. Who, are, who is a student here? Are there any students? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four. Yeah. Okay. Um, because the main thing is you know, the people that are here we already know the field, you can interact with people who have been practicing in the field, and, and that mentorship you can't replace. So please speak up. Any I'm pointing at a student. I'm pointing at another student. <laughs> no? So. I was wondering why projection matching is done in Fourier space instead of real space, and I guess you like hit the hammer on the, the nail on the head, and like I guess the points for the convolution and the cross correlation are much easier to compute in Fourier space. That's the primary reason. I didn't know that projection matching was done in Fourier space. Wh wh which package is doing that? Um, well for. In, in, in your first slide, when you're using like the common lines, I guess, you convert everything, you do, take the Fourier transform first yeah. before you compare the projection to yeah. the cross, or like the cross section of the projection to the, the structure, I guess. Um. Well, I, I <coughs> what, what, I've, what I've shown there initially are, are really the concepts, and that it doesn't mean that it's done this way. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the projection matching is, is really normally done in real space. That's where it's done. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, let's thank you know, Frank. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these slides will be on online right now. <coughs> so you can go and see what you're missing actually get foundational knowledge is critical for all scientists, especially if you want to be in this field. Thank you. Okay, students could sign the sign-in sheet.
Um, right here. 